Thank you, Karen. Um, that was really great because that was Karen's personal perspective <laughs> on leadership. And I, apart from giving Karen like the parameters of what I wanted her to talk about, that wasn't scripted at all in terms of what we're doing in the leadership model. Um, but it actually resonates really, really strongly with absolutely everything that is in our model. And I think that will come through um, as I go through the next bit. So the, ne the next part is um, the model. As Jennifer Aniston said, this is the science. Um, it's not scientific at all. It's quite straightforward. But um, what I'm going to do now is, um, is take you through um, the model. So I'm going to start with just talking about why, why we did this. Um, it's really important to understand. Oh. I've been told, I've forgotten the wordles. First mistake, don't forget the wordle. So, just collect the wordles in. Okay. Any, any last struggles we'll pick up and, and uh, include. Um, as I said, what I want to start by talking about is, is why we did this. You know, we've, we've heard about why leadership's important, but why did we as we're all community trust decide that we wanted to look at leadership. Well, to be honest, way back in 2012, when we, um, just after we were set up as a trust and we developed an HR strategy, um, as, a, as a board, we decided that leadership was absolutely crucial in this organization. We recognized that as a trust, as a newly created community trust, um, we were operating in a new environment, operating in a healthcare environment that has changed significantly from probably what most of us were familiar with four or five you know and longer ago four or five years ago um, it's a competitive environment isn't it it's an environment where we're we're working in different ways with partners and certainly in different ways with our patients and service users as well and because of this that we decided that as an organization we needed to be able to move and change and respond to that environment and in our HR strategy, I'll read what we said in it, because it's strange now to think we wrote it back in 2012, and we knew that it was going to take a while to, to implement this because there were other things we had to get in place first. But we said, leadership is about acting independently with both, with both responsibility and accountability, inspiring and encouraging others to develop and perform to the best of their ability, encouraging <coughs> and embracing innovation <coughs> and ideas. And that's just what Karen's been describing, and that is exactly what we've tried to encompass in our, our model. Um, we already have a really strong vision. I think everybody's familiar with our vision um, to provide great integrated care to our patients and service users. We have really strong values that are embedded through our appraisal and through everything that we do. We get great patient feedback. We get good staff survey feedback as well. So to be honest, we're doing pretty well. And there's an argument for if it ain't broke, why fix it? But it's about how we move from being a good organization to being a great organization and how we operate in that really challenging environment. And the way we do that is by moving on from having a vision and having embedded values to seeing the behaviors that have that impact it's that impact every single day. It's those lollipop moments that we referred to earlier. Every single member of staff being understanding what the impact of their behaviours are and ensuring that those are, have a positive impact and that they have a positive impact on patients, first and foremost, but on team, team members as well, because it's about how you interact within your team. And then ultimately on stakeholders, and by stakeholders we mean other organisations that we interact with, GPs, hospital trusts, others, other partners, um, and our commissioners. So if we get this right, if we ensure that every single member of staff is demonstrating those behaviours in the way that, that we would like, it'll be better for staff because staff will be developed, staff will be developed to their potential. It'll be better for patients, which is what we're all here for <coughs> at the end of the day. And it'll be better for our future as an organisation. So how did we do it? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we had a, a team. We've had a working group looking at this with people from um, board members, HR, learning and development. We've also had team members from across the organisation. We've had Norma and Richard involved, which has been really great because we've got some perspective from people who are actually delivering services out there in the organisation. 
Um, we thought about how we could do it and um, we recognised that creating a leadership model is not an easy thing. It's, it can be quite a scientific thing to do. But there is already a model in existence from the NHS Leadership Academy. It's called the Healthcare Leadership Model. It looks like this. And I have to say, when we looked at it, some of us were familiar with it already, but when we looked at it, we thought, oh dear, that's not particularly easy to understand, is it? When you pull it apart, it makes a huge amount of sense. It has been researched, it has been developed at a national level, it's in place to support particularly um, people in leadership roles at a national level. Um, and so it defines all the personal qualities that are required to be a great leader in the healthcare environment. But what we've done is looked at it and said, how can we make this relevant to our organisation? How can we make it relevant to every single member of staff in our trust? And so what we've done is adapted it. Um, we've moved it away from just being about people in specific leadership roles, and we've developed an extra level. There are four levels within it. We've developed an extra level called the core level that will apply to absolutely everyone, regardless of their role, regardless of the area they work in, whether it's clinical or non-clinical, whether it's managerial or non-managerial. We also cross-referenced it with our values because it's so our values are so embedded in our organization that it was really important that we didn't do something that actually conflicted with those because it's so essential to us that those values drive everything we do we also cross-referenced it with the six c's and you'll all be familiar from our appraisal that our values and our six c's for clinical staff is something that we we hold very um, dear to our hearts and we didn't want to move away from either of those two really key principles once we'd done all that work we realised that we were a relatively small group and we didn't want to create something that didn't have any resonance outside in the rest of the trust. So we created some focus groups and we got some involvement from um, wider um, areas of, of uh, the trust. And they were really, really helpful because it helped us to understand whether the language was right <laughs> and whether we, whether we were heading in the right direction. They liked it, so we decided to use it. So what is it? It is that but it looks different. This is what it is. So essentially, it's quite simple. It's nine leadership behaviours. They're described there, and see, we've put our, our lovely origami bird, our unfolding bird, unfolding your potential, and um, we've put that in the middle, and we've described what the rationale is for this, because great leadership equals great patient care. That is why we're doing this. Um, you've got the nine different elements there. Um, we've kept the words from the national leadership model. It's important because some people who um, use this will go onto the NHS Leadership Academy website and they will use resources that are made available and they all link in. So it's really important that we have that strong linkage with something that is used nationally. But we recognise that some of these words might sound a little bit... Um, corporate or might, might not appear to relate to absolutely everyone's role. So if I take something like um, inspiring shared purpose, you might be sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, inspiring shared purpose, that is not my job. How do I do that? What that means is staying true to NHS principles and values. And under every single one of these, um, <coughs> these behaviours, there is um, a description of why it's important, <coughs> what it isn't, and there are some questions um, that set out, that help you to understand um, how each behaviour relates to you. So um, they're not meant to be answered yes or no, they're meant to get you thinking about how these particular areas of behaviour apply to you in your role. So another example would be um, engaging the team, for example. You might think, well, that's not my job. I'm, it's not, I'm, I'm not the team manager. It's not my job to engage the team. What that means is recognising other people's contributions, recognising that other people have a role to play and how you fit in with them. So it is something that is relevant to absolutely everybody. You have to just go underneath the, the, the title to understand and read those questions that apply to you. So I mentioned the, the levels. Um, oh, sorry, I need to turn that back one. I mentioned the levels. I said there are five levels of leadership behaviours, um, ranging from core through essential, proficient, strong, and exemplary. Now this will be different depending on the role that you undertake. Um, you have there 
it's a bit difficult to see in the sun, but you have there a description next to each level, an indicative um, level attached to each of the um, each of the five levels. So, for example, core is straightforward. That applies to every single member of staff in the trust. As you move through essential, proficient, strong, you'll see examples of the types of roles that these levels would apply to. So. At essential, that would be a line manager. You might only line manage one person. All registered clinical staff would be expected to be at essential level. Health advisors, project leads. A project lead might not be a line manager. A project lead might not have anybody working to them at all. But because of the role that they undertake, that's the level of leadership behaviours we would expect them to demonstrate. It's not quite as simple as that because actually what we also know is that some roles will require different levels and that's why we've overlapped them all. It's quite difficult to show it but we, we're trying to get the impression here that although you may be, for example, a project lead and you may be at the essential level, because of the project that you're leading, it might be a really wide-ranging project, you might actually have to show some of these qualities at a higher level because your role requires it. And that's something that you will sit down with your line manager and discuss. It's not something that, it's, it's, it's not a test and we're not going to be, um, you know, we're not going to be checking out, you know, what people are doing and are they at the right level. It's a discussion that you'll have with, with your line manager. So who's it for? Oh, actually, sorry, can I go back one? Sorry. I just wanted to, um, in terms of the levels, just give an example because I think, as I said before, there's all the different behaviours and then there's five levels within each example, within each um, behaviour. So if I just give you an example of one leading with care, um, we talked about what is it. Um, it's about understanding the team, understanding the new, unique qualities of every team and providing a caring, safe environment for everyone to do their jobs effectively. Why is it important? because we need to care for team members as individuals so that they can provide the care that patients need. What it's not is failing to understand the impact of your own behaviours on other people or taking responsibility away from other people. So for, for, the, for the leading with care um, behaviour, at a core level, an example of what you would be asking yourself is, do I carry out genuine acts of kindness for my team? very straightforward, you know, do you treat your team members with respect and kindness? At the essential level, that would be, do my actions demonstrate that the health and well-being of my team are important to me? Are you taking that, that role of caring for your team? Proficient, can I read others and act with appropriate empathy, especially when they're different from me? So a slightly higher level of understanding of the, the, the differences and the different um, uh, personalities, behaviours, etc., that you might see in a team. At the strong level, it would say, do I, pa do I pay close attention to what motivates individuals in my team so I can channel their energy to deliver for service users? So this is somebody with a wider range of responsibilities looking to really play to the strengths of their team. And at exemplary level, do I take positive action to make sure other leaders are taking responsibility for the emotional well-being of their teams? And the exemplary level you can see there is divisional managers, heads of service, indicatively heads of managers, uh, heads of service and executives. So that's people with wide-ranging responsibilities for ensuring that whole services, whole divisions are performing well and that managers within those areas are managing the well-being of their staff. So you can see how at each level the responsibility increases, but we've all got a role to play in each of those leadership behaviours. So who's it for? I think I've probably said this a number of times. It's for everyone. It's for you. It's for every single one of you. Um, it's an opportunity for every single one of you to develop those leadership behaviours and to be the best that you can be. But how are we going to do it? You've seen the model. Um, it's going to be delivered through appraisal in the first instance. So. Um, Everybody has an appraisal and we've got a fantastic track record on ensuring that every single member of our staff has an appraisal. Um, it will form part of next year's appraisal and that's a really important part of, of today. 
everything doesn't kick off today. This is to inform you. This is to tell you what's coming and to start raising awareness of the leadership model. It will actually, if you like, kick into action from appraisal next year, so from May next year. In that appraisal, there'll be two parts. The first part will be your performance, like you're used to discussing already. Have you met your objectives, etc., etc.? Have you met your KSF competencies? All of that. Then there'll be a part two, and that'll be about your development and your leadership behaviours. So just to be very clear, this does not link to pay progression. It's a completely separate part. You have your performance part and then your development part. And this is where the development part comes in. So this is what we will be using as our framework for staff development moving forward. Um, part two, if you like then, of the appraisal will be what we call it a talent conversation. That's, that's a new concept, we recognise that. It's straightforward, it's a discussion between the line manager and the individual that needs to be transparent, supportive and developmental. It's about how you can work together as a manager and individual to develop individuals to become the best they can be, to develop their potential. You'll use the model to understand where you are in your current role and you'll be asked to, asked to consider your development aspirations. So everybody will have different career aspirations. For a lot of people, People want to come and do a really good job. And the majority, that's what the majority of staff tell us. I just want to do a really good job. And what they don't want is to have layers and layers of bureaucracy piled upon them. And that's absolutely fine. But what we do want is for every single member of staff to be the very best they can be in their role, if that's what they want. Um, you may have aspirations to do more within your role. You may have aspirations to do something at the same level, a slightly different, a slightly extended role. You may want to aim for a more senior role in the future. There'll be an open discussion about where you are now, how you're performing, where you are in terms of the behaviours that are, are relative to your current level, and what those um, aspirations look like, and what perhaps time frame, if you, if you are looking for something um, in a different role, what, those, what that time frame might look like. And then there'll be a discussion about how we can develop your skills. What, what do you need to do to either develop within your role as it is now, or as whatever you want to be in the future. Um, it won't always be a static thing. So we won't have the discussion in May, June, July next year at appraisal time, and then that's it. You are then committed to whatever you say on the 10th of May next year, and we'll hold you to it. That's not how this works. As I say, it's a, it's a very iterative process, and it's very personal to the individual. Um, Everybody is in a different situation. Everybody has different career aspirations. Everybody has different personal situations. And you change, don't you? I know I've changed during my career. What I wanted when I was 25 was very different to what I wanted when I was 35, and we won't go any further than 35. Um, but, but it changed considerably. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in careers at 25. I wasn't interested in the slightest. I was interested in going out and having a good time. Once I got to 35, I'd really found my niche and knew what I wanted to do, and I kind of starting to see where I might want my career to go. Um, so it changes. You may have a family and think, actually, that's my focus at the moment. I don't want to do anything else. But in a few years' time, when the kids are older, I might be interested in developing my career. It will be personal to you. There are no rules, and it will change. Um, so we have the talent conversation. That enables us, as well as supporting you as individuals, it enables us as an organisation to have what we then call talent reviews. And this is enabling us to understand the strengths within our organisation and the potential and the talent that we have. So what we'll do is effectively map using a grid. There's a grid that we'll use to help um, support managers to have those conversations. Um, and then we'll use that grid on a sort of a wider and wider scale to say, What's the spread in our organisation? Where, where have we got people who are doing a fantastic job and want to carry on developing? Where have we got people who've got potential to move into other roles and stretch? There's no quotas. We're not looking to say we're trying to get a certain number of people through a certain number of jobs or anything like that. This is about just understanding our organisation better and understanding all that fantastic talent and potential that we have out there. So we'll have those at service, division, and then trust level. And that'll give us amazingly rich information about how, for instance, when we've got um, projects, perhaps, that um, we, we need some resource for. If we know there are people who are looking to be stretched and are ready to do that, we can match those up. 
And then that will also help us with succession planning. We'll be wanting every team, because it's what we do at board level. We, always, we have a plan to say, well, if we have any gaps in the future, how are we going to fill them? Can we fill them internally? Can we develop people so that they can come through and become the directors of the future? We want that to happen in every single team. What are the key roles in teams and services that actually, if somebody left tomorrow, we'd really need to think carefully about how we filled them? Who's ready right now to step into those roles in an emergency? Who might be ready in a year? Who might be ready in three or five years? And just starting to plan that so that we could think, actually, we haven't got anybody here. We've got a bit of a problem. We need to put some development in. So what's in it for you? Um, hopefully, you're not scared by this. I'm very, very hopeful that this isn't scaring you and that you're saying this is supportive because that is what we want to do. We want to develop those key leadership behaviours in every member of staff so that you can be the very best you can be and you can develop to, the, to your potential. It's an opportunity for you to really discuss your role and your career preferences with your manager and start to think about how you can build um, the skills you need to develop in the way you want to develop. You will get support from your line manager. That's absolutely key in this. It's about having that relationship with your line manager where you talk honestly about what you want to achieve and what you can achieve. And then there'll be central resources available to every member of staff via staff zone. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So what's in it for our organisation? I think we've talked already about what's in it for the organisation in terms of it's about better care for patients. The end, the end result of this is by developing these fantastic leadership behaviours across every single member of staff it's ultimately going to result in better patient care. But we've got a video to show you. I'm hoping that's going to work because it's looking a bit white at the moment. But um, we've got a video to show you. It's, it's actually about a nuclear submarine. But bear with me because there are some synergies between nuclear submarines and the health service. You just have to watch to find out what those are. So we'll press play. I was trained for one submarine, my guys were trained to do what they were told. That's a deadly combination. We all know organizations where, where people just follow the leader into disastrous situations. So I got my guys together and I said, hey, we've got a problem here. I was trained for another submarine, you're trained to do whatever nonsense comes out of my mouth. That's right, Captain. I mean, they knew, they already knew. I was pretty much talking to myself. So I said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, guys? And we talked about it. Okay, what I really wanted to do was get ready for the inspection. But we were sitting in the wardroom. We spent a couple hours. We were talking about it. And we came up with all these different things. And, well, you Captain, you just got to be smarter. You got to give better orders. It's like, well, how am I going to learn a whole nuclear submarine, miles of valves and pipes? Like, I spent a year learning Olympia, two weeks over here. How, I mean, so, okay, so in a year we'll be safe? That's not going to work. We had to deploy the submarine in six months. Um, so we talked about it and they said, okay, there's only one logical solution. We figured it out. You, they're pointing at me, you shut up. What do you mean? That's not what captains do. That's not what captains of nuclear submarines do. They walk around, they give orders. They sound like Russell Crowe. Head two thirds, dive, make it up 500 feet. Helm left 15 degrees weather, steady course, two, five, five. Load torpedoes and tubes, one, two, three, and four. Flood down, open outer doors, right? And I thought about it. And you know what? They were right. So at that point, I vowed never to give another order. And if you came down on my submarine, it would have been very confusing because you couldn't have pointed. It would have been hard to say, well, who's, who's the captain here? Because you wouldn't have seen me giving orders. I did retain one order. The final order to launch a weapon, a torpedo or a missile, I, I kept with me because I felt that, that was, since that was going to result in the deaths of other human beings, that I didn't want that on anyone's conscience but, but mine. That was my moral and ethical responsibility. 
But even though everything else, in the Navy there's long lists of things that says the captain has to authorize. Captain should authorize. You got a couple nukes in your group, they'll tell you it's true. Captain authorize, submerge the ship, get underway, start up the reactor, shut down the reactor, connect to shore power, divorce from shore power. On and on, break, rig for dive, on and on and on, pages of these things. I just refused to give those orders. What we replaced it with was intent. Instead of giving instructions, if you want your people to think, don't give instructions, give intent. So they would come to you, hey, uh, what do you want me to do? Well, uh, left full rudder, steady course 255. No. I said, well, what, you, what, what are we trying to accomplish here today? Well, we're trying to get in position so that when the enemy submarine comes through, OK, so where do you think we should position the ship? Uh, I don't, maybe over here. Good idea. Go there. You give intent to them, and they give intent to you. So my officer stopped requesting permission. And every other submarine, Captain, request permission to submerge the ship. Submerge the ship. Submerge the ship, I. On Santa Fe's, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. Very well. And they did it. And it might seem like it's a very small, nuanced change of language, but it was hugely powerful because the psychological ownership now shifts to them. They need to discover the answer. Otherwise, you're always the answer man. You can never go home and eat dinner. And so we started doing this. And it was hugely powerful. Actually, we went another step. Then I got smarter and I said, when the, when the officer said, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship, I, I would ask him, well, is it, what do you think I'm thinking right now? And he'd look at me, uh, hard to tell. I'm guessing you're wondering whether it's safe. Bingo! I said, well, convince me it's safe. He said, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship. All men are below. Hatches are shut. Ship's rigged for dive. I checked the bottom depth. Ship is, the submarine's in the water that's been assigned to us. Then, I was, then later I would ask them, is it the right thing to do? And they would say, well, yes, sir, because our mission requires that we... And these are the two pillars that I think support this idea of giving control. These are the two pillars that need to be in place. The, the technical competence, which is represented by, is it safe? And the organizational clarity, which is represented by, is it the right thing to do? And you put those things in place, and then you can give control. And you give control, and you put those things in place. And you are off to the races. So think about what's happening now. My officers are starting to think like me, because I have to think, like, where, well, where, where should we do the ship? And so the guys below them. Now, this took, this took 24 hours to happen. It took a couple years for the full implementation, but immediately there was change. The officers started thinking like me, and so pretty soon I could go in the engine room, find the engine room lower level watch, who was taking logs in the lube oil pumps, and he would know what the submarine was doing. He would know whether we were up tight, close to the enemy, and it was time to stay quiet, or whether we had backed out a little bit, and this may be a good time to change filters and make a little bit of noise. A year later, we received another inspection. A year later, we received an inspection. The inspecting team gave us the highest grade they had ever seen. Not that year, not in the Pacific, ever seen. Why? I mean, this crew had a captain who was a dummy. It's because that needle moved, started moving up. And on another submarine, there was one guy in charge, one guy giving orders, one guy thinking, and 134 people doing what they're told. I don't care how smart you are. On my submarine, I got 135 thinking, active, passionate, creative, proactive, taking initiative people. It's a tidal wave. You don't stand a chance. Here's the solution. Move the authority to where the information is. You mean the software engineer can decide whether we ship the software? Yeah. You mean the client, my, my salesman, can, just, can close the deal? Well, up to $1,000. No. Yes. Whatever the price? Yes. What does it take to make that happen? Now, if you're picturing a lot of people out there doing crazy things and a bunch of arrows going in a bunch of different directions, you have the wrong picture. You, cre you create 
the environment so that those people are out there making decisions as if the CEO were standing right behind them. And if it's not the same decision, it's actually a better decision because they have the information. And not only will you get better speed of execution because now you don't have this delay, what happens is those people feel like they matter because they're thinking. You engender thinking. You create the environment for thinking. The secret is nothing, is, nothing I said is hard. There's nothing hard. The only thing that's hard is you. It will feel wrong. You've been genetically and culturally programmed to take charge and make it happen. Take, take control and attract followers. And what you want is to give control and create leaders. It will feel wrong and you will repeatedly, repeatedly start down this path if you so choose and then you'll be angry at yourself like I was. And you will have a failure and you'll go back to the old ways. And you will pick yourself up and you will go again. You will go again. And by doing so, you will achieve the greatest thing possible. You will have achieved greatness, not because of the deeds and acts that you did, but because you set an environment where the people around you and their families and their schools and their organizations and their businesses, they've achieved greatness. That will be the greatest thing of all. Go forth and be great. can see the connections between the, the nuclear submarine and what we're trying to do here. Um, it's about being safe, isn't it? It's about giving people that ability to make decisions, but being competent, being safe, and ensuring that they're doing the right thing. Because when we're dealing in healthcare, it's important that we're doing the right thing and that we're safe. Um, so I think that's really, I think that's really good. Because it's exactly what we're trying to achieve. It's just that we're not launching nuclear weapons. Um, a few final slides from me. Um, what support will you get? We've talked about appraisal already. That's where um, you'll get the most um, support from your line manager. We will, of course, be training line managers to do that. We recognise this is new, and for line managers it might be a bit scary. So um, we will be putting on training for line managers. Everybody will be trained before they have to do appraisals involving talent conversations, etc. A few people look relieved at that, actually. Um, we'll also be doing roadshows for staff. We're having two launch events. Recognise we can't get around everybody. We are um, videoing it so that we can share it more widely. Um, but there'll be roadshows so that people can sort of drop in and ask questions. There's a guide for staff. It's already been um, developed. Well, it's in development. It's nearly done. Um, and that will be available on Staff Zone for everybody um, to either download or use electronically. And there'll also be central resources on Staff Zone. So lots of um, suggestions for how you can develop those skills. So when you have that conversation, you think, this is what I need to do. This is how I need to develop. Um, lots of different resources. So online resources, references for books, videos. We do already have... Um, uh, an internal development program. We have a management development program. Uh, we also have um, piloted a, le a leadership program for band sixes and sevens in nursing. That's just happening right now. The plan is to roll that out to all clinical staff. Following that, we're going to develop one for non-clinical staff as well. This is a journey. This is something that isn't going to happen overnight. Everything won't be available on day one. It's going to be something that, as a trust, we develop over a period of time. Um, We'll be having a mentoring scheme, again, something that we're developing um, where we'll be able to access internal and external mentors through the Northwest Leadership Academy. Um, and we mentioned about that link to stretch projects. Um, that will be managed through the PMO um, so that we can make those really strong links internally. And then we'll also be looking, again, in the future to how we can make um, leadership development available with and through other trusts potentially through secondments, not necessarily long secondments, very short ones on projects, etc., or involvement in work in other trusts so that people can get the experience that they need. I mentioned Staff Zone. Um, this is where all the information will be. Hopefully it's kind of where you go for all your information now. Um, there will be a leadership section on Staff Zone. In fact, I think it's already there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that's being developed as we speak. So all the information about the model will be there. 
Um, and I mentioned the guide. This is what the guide will look like, um, the booklet. It will be able to be downloaded um, through Staff Zone. So when can you get started? Um, as I said, Staff Zone is already up and running, but the content is coming, is coming soon. Um, we'll be training managers between Christmas and um, the start of the appraisal period, and that's when we'll also be doing road shows. Um, and then the appraisal start in May to July, so that's when the kickoff really, really begins. Um, and then, that, as I said, the development of the materials and resources to support people is ongoing. I think one of the key things to emphasise is that it's for you to access those resources. It's not for your line manager to put everything in place for you. It's about you accessing those resources and you identifying what. And it's not all about going on training courses. Let's, be, let's remember, this is about developing your skills. A lot of that can be done in the role that you're in, in the job that you're in, by working with your line manager and undertaking um, perhaps new, new skills, etc. Um, we'll also be running, I should say, a yearly event. Um, it's not on there, but we, this is the launch event. The plan is, once we've got the leadership, model up and running through appraisal, we'll have an annual leadership event and perhaps we'll come back to the Wordle at the end in relation to that. So that's the, that's the model, that's how it will work, that's where it will fit. Um, it's a bit of a journey for the trust and it'll be a bit of a journey for every individual and every line manager. It is new, it'll take some getting used to, that's why we're having the training and the road shows. But I hope, um, I hope it's going to be really exciting. Has anybody got any questions at this point? You can have to pause and have some questions um, on the model and what's, what we've said so far. No? Stunned into silence, my goodness. Okay. Well, there'll be an opportunity for some more questions at the end. Um, the next part of the, the, the agenda is for some leadership stories from people in the trust.